glad that you are here, and we appreciate your attendance this morning. I do want to share with you this evening will be a little bit of a different um, format than what we've had in the past. Uh, this evening at 6 o'clock, we will all gather here in the sanctuary instead of our classrooms uh, that we've been gathering in over the last few months. But we'll gather in here at 6 o'clock. We'll have a, a couple of songs, and then uh, Brother Chase Spradlin will share his testimony and a little bit about his, his ministry as well. And then we'll give a time for you to do a question and answer with him. He is, uh, he is here to, um, to try out, I guess you'd call it, for the youth pastor position here at the church. And uh, he was here Wednesday night and had uh, taught in the 7th through 12th grade class this morning in the 11 o'clock. He'll be teaching the 4th, 5th, and 6th grade. And then tonight, uh, you'll get to hear his testimony as well. So we encourage you to come back tonight and be a part of that service. Um, also want to share with you that uh, we will be having a deacons and trustees meeting on Tuesday evening at 6 o'clock, and that will be deacons and trustees both at 6. So uh, in the past, we've had trustees come in later. Trustees will ask you to come in at 6 o'clock to be a part of that meeting. Our quarterly business meeting will be January 13th. That's Wednesday at 7 o'clock. So we've got a couple of meetings coming up this week. And then some of you have asked about the Red Cross. They will be here on Monday, January 25th from 2 to 6. And that will be uh, the second, well, I guess the fourth blood drive really that we've had here. And they were very appreciative this last time when they came. And I believe there was 18 units that they were able to get. And um, that was one of the larger drives that they've had here in Pocahontas. So uh, we scheduled them to come back. And you can go online and register at... Um, redcross.org or you can call in at 1-800-RED-CROSS and register. You do need to schedule a time though for those um, instead of uh, just walking in. They, they kind of got overloaded last time a little bit so if you would schedule a time if you would like to come and donate. Any questions about things going on here at the church this morning? All right if not if you would stand together once again we're going to begin our service uh, with a song whosoever will. Uh, we know that, that the gospel is available for all people. Michael, if you would go ahead and come. The gospel is available for all, but it does take us responding. So whosoever will may come, may come to not only church, but may come to the gospel, a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. That also takes us being willing, though, to share that. And we want to be comfortable going forward in 2020, sharing the gospel with those around us, so that they may be able to come and accept Christ. We'll sing all three verses on whosoever will. Whosoever heareth shout, shout the sound, spread the blessed tidings all the world around. Tell the joyful news wherever man is found, whosoever will may come, whosoever will, whosoever will, send the proclamation over vale and hill, tis a loving father calls the wonder home, whosoever will may Whosoever cometh need not delay, now the door is open, enter while you may. Jesus is the true, the only living way, whosoever will may come. Whosoever will, whosoever will, send the proclamation over a loving father calls the wonder home whosoever will may come whosoever will the promise is secure whosoever will forever must endure whosoever will tis life forevermore whosoever will may come Whosoever will, whosoever will, send the proclamation over vale and hill, tis a love. 
loving Father calls the wanderer home, whomsoever will may come. All right, y'all may be seated. <clears throat> Our next selection this morning is Whosoever Meaneth Me. Big theme today of Whosoever. I am happy today and the sun shines bright The clouds have been rolled away For the Savior said Never will may come with him to stay Whosoever surely meaneth me Surely meaneth me Oh, surely meaneth me Whosoever surely meaneth me, whosoever meaneth me. All my hopes have been raised, oh, his name be praised. His glory has filled my soul. I've been lifted up and from sin set free. His blood hath made me whole. Whosoever surely meaneth me, surely meaneth me, oh, surely meaneth me, whosoever surely meaneth me, whosoever meaneth me. Oh, what wonderful love, oh, what grace divine, that Jesus should die for me. I was lost in sin, for the world I pined, but now I am set free. Whosoever surely meaneth me, surely meaneth me, oh, surely meaneth me. Whosoever surely meaneth me, whosoever meaneth me. All right, and our final selection this even, morning, not evening, uh, it's going to be, This World Is Not My Home. We'll sing all four and stand on the last verse. This world is not my home, I'm just a passing through. My treasures are laid up somewhere beyond the blue. The angels beckon me from heaven's open door, and I can't feel at home in this world anymore. Oh Lord, you know I have no friend like you. If heaven's not my home, then Lord, what will I do? The angels beckon me from heaven's open door, and I can't feel at home in this world anymore. They're all expecting me, and that's one thing I know. I fixed it up with Jesus some 40 years ago. I know he'll take me through, though I am weak and poor, and I can't feel at home in this world anymore. Oh Lord, you know I have no friend like you. If heaven's not my home, then Lord, what will I do? The angels beckon me from heaven's open door, and I can't feel at home in this world anymore. I have a loving mother over in glory land. I don't expect to stop until I shake her hand. She's waiting now for me in heaven's open door, and I can't feel at home in this world anymore. Oh Lord, you know I have no friend like you. If heaven's not my home, then Lord, what will I do? The angels beckon me from heaven's open door, and I can't feel at home in this world anymore. Y'all stand with us and sing. Just over in glory land, we'll live eternally. The saints on every hand 
and all shouting victory. Their songs of sweetest praise drift back from heaven's shore. And I can't feel at home in this world anymore. Oh Lord, you know I have no friend like you. If heaven's not my home, then Lord, what will I do? The angels beckon me from heaven's open door, and I can't feel at home in this world anymore. Uh, Brother Roel Baslini, would you lead us in prayer this morning? Amen. Y'all may be seated as Sister Ron Stone comes and leads us in our special music this morning. You are the one that 
God, we praise. You are the one we adore. You give the healing and grace. Our hearts always hunger for. Oh, our hearts always hunger for. Appreciate that so much, Ms. Rhonda. Um, what a true statement. Our hearts should hunger for the Lord. Uh, there's a lot of things that the world offers for us to hunger for, but uh, our hunger should be for God and His Word. And uh, we pray that you've come today with that hunger um, in your heart, even now, as we turn to God's Word. Look with me in Luke chapter 16, if you would, for our text this morning. We're going to begin in verse 1. While you're turning there, W.A. Criswell, who was a known uh, minister, tells a story of a man who was asked the question, What did you do yesterday? What did you do yesterday? The man's reply to that question was, Yesterday I taught a class in the Criswell College. On Tuesday I was down in the Rio Grande Valley working on Vacation Bible School. On Wednesday, I was operating in our Baptist hospital in Nigeria. On Thursday, I was teaching the Word of God in the Amazon jungle. And on Friday, I was building a church house in the Philippines. On Saturday, I was preaching on the streets in the Japanese capital of Tokyo. The friend that asked the question replied, Sir, even in the age of the jet airplane, that is not possible for you to be able to do. And the man replied, but I do it every day. He said, I dedicate to the Lord a gift in the First Baptist Church of Dallas, and it goes all over the earth doing good for Christ and His kingdom. In a world that we live in that's dominated by the love of money, we find that used correctly, money can also enable a great work to continue around the world. As we look at Luke chapter 16, in these first 13 verses, we see the recording of this dishonest manager who is confronted by the owner, we might call him his boss, and he engages in some serious reflection and then comes up with an interesting solution. As the owner realizes the dishonesty of the manager, he basically tells him to clean out his desk. His time of working there is over. The manager then goes on to work or devising a plan that would allow him to still be cared for by those that were indebted to his boss or the owner. To fully understand this situation, we must realize that in Jewish culture, it was illegal to charge interest to a fellow Jew. So they could borrow something, and all you could do is charge them exactly what it was worth. You could not add interest onto that. No such thing as what we term today interest in principle. However, what they would do is include a usury charge that sometimes would be as much as 100% of the amount of the commodities. And usually it was added on by the manager, not the owner. So this markup was what the manager would profit instead of the owner. So in this example of our text, the first debtor that we'll read about actually only owed 50 measures of oil to the owner, and the other 50% of the debt was actually to the manager. The second debtor owed 80% of the debt to the owner and 20% to the manager. So the manager basically wipes out this debt that was owed to him so that these debtors would always be indebted to him, or basically this manager would always have a place that he could stay and a table that he could sit at to eat because these people would have owed him something. 
Imagine as the disciples listen to this story that, or parable that uh, Christ tells. Imagine when they first heard it, they are expecting to hear that the owner would deal rather harshly with this manager. And yet to their surprise, the owner actually commends the manager for his creativity, which seems somewhat backwards to us. He didn't approve of what the former employee had done, but he certainly admired his foresight and his craftiness. Read with me in Luke chapter 16, starting in verse 1. It says, He also said to the disciples, There was a rich man who had a manager, and charges were brought against him, that this man was wasting his possessions. And he called him and said to him, What is this that I hear about you? Turn in the account of your management for you can no longer be manager. Basically, clean out your desk, your time's over. And the manager said to himself, What shall I do since my master is taking the management away from me? I'm not strong enough to dig, and I'm ashamed to beg. I've decided what to do, so that when I am removed from management, people may receive me into their houses. So summoning his master's debtors one by one, he said to the first, How much do you owe my master? He said, a hundred measures of oil. And he said to him, take your bill and sit down quickly and write 50. In other words, he actually owed 50 to the owner, and 50 of that was actually what the manager had charged him. So the manager takes away the debt that he owed him. This individual was now indebted to the manager. Verse 7, then he said to another, how much do you owe? And he said, a hundred measures of wheat. He said to him, take your bill and write 80. The master commanded, commended, I'm sorry, the dishonest manager for his shrewdness. For the sons of this world are more shrewd in dealing with their own generation than the sons of light. Verse 8 is a very important verse in what Christ is teaching here. I want you to, to kind of take note of that and we'll come back to it. Verse 9, And I tell you, make friends for yourselves by means of unrighteous wealth, so that when it fails they may receive you into the eternal dwellings. One who is faithful in very little is also faithful in much. And one who is dishonest in very little is also dishonest in much. If then you have not been faithful in the unrighteous wealth, who will entrust to you the true riches? And if you have not been faithful in that which is another's, who will give you that which is your own? No servant can serve two masters. For either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. Would you bow with me for a word of prayer? Heavenly Father, we do come to you today, Lord, looking at this teaching that you provided to your disciples and to those who were gathered around you on that day. Lord, we're thankful that, that Luke recorded this, put it in the, the gospel that he recorded but Lord, we also pray that we not let it go by our ears today without allowing it to penetrate our heart. Understanding, Lord, that you have placed much in our care, and what you have placed in our care, Lord, should be used in a special way for the advancement of your kingdom. Help us to be faithful to do that. And we pray this in your Son's name, Jesus the Christ. Amen. As Jesus shared this with His disciples, notice those words in verse 8 again, the last half of that. It says, For the sons of the world are more shrewd in dealing with their own generation than the sons of light. This dishonest manager had faced reality and used all of his intelligence, his wit, and his energy to make sure that he was took care of here on earth. Now you've probably seen people like this in your lifetime as well. They invest everything that they have in trying to do something illegal. When if they would take that energy and that time and that devotion and put it into something good, there would be tremendous things that would happen in this world. But instead they devote themselves to trying to get by in this world and they use all the abilities that God has given them in a negative way. You've seen this happen in the past. You've heard of it happen in the past. But if we're not careful, this can happen in our own life as well. 
The sons of this world, as Jesus says, are more shrewd at dealing with things than Christians are at sharing the gospel and promoting the kingdom of God. As Christians, we should give more attention to the things that concern eternity than we do the worldly business here on earth. But how often do we do that? You see, sometimes the worldly business overcomes us to the point that we lose sight that there's something much greater than worldly business that we're dealing with here on earth. And we must not let it take our focus off of serving God Himself. Looking at the text, there's three lessons that I want us to take away this morning. First from verse 9. Jesus says, make friends for yourselves by means of unrighteous wealth, so that when it fails, they may receive you into eternal dwellings. These friends that Jesus speak of probably refer to people who have been spiritually benefited by one's wealth here on earth. In other words, we used our talents, abilities, the things that God had blessed us with in order to reach someone here on earth with the gospel. That's the friends that Christ is talking about. It may include also uh, God in His redeeming of humanity, welcoming a newly departed and generous believer into glory. It may include us winning a soul through God's working through our language or our use of our voice. It may include us just being hospitable toward someone who is in need of something. And by the loving hand that we may extend, they may see the love of God. This would leave us with a picture of God, His angels, and grateful souls. Eternal friends, those who have heard the gospel because of one's giving, greeting and leading a faithful believer into eternity. Can you imagine if those that you have witnessed to, those that you have invested in for the sake of the gospel here on earth, can you imagine if they would be standing at the gates of heaven when we walk in, if they were there to greet us? And I would ask you in your mind, if this were the case, how many people would be greeting you when you walked in? You see, there's an importance that we must have in investing in others, not because we would be greeted by them, but because the gospel is worth sharing with them. There's a song, I believe it was Ray Bolts that first wrote it or, or, or performed it. But the, the title of the song is Thank You for Giving to the Lord. And in that song he speaks of individuals who had uh, invested in, uh, or an individual that had invested in other individuals' lives. And the song basically tells the story of what all this individual had done here on earth. When we think about our life today, are we investing in them or are we taking from them? And I'm not meaning necessarily doing illegal activities, but are we letting them invest in us more than we're investing in someone else? There comes a point in time where we have to begin being the investor instead of the invested. What is absolutely clear is that our wealth and our possessions are to be used to win eternal friends. When we talk about how we are to use all that God has blessed us with, we are to give generously of all of His blessings that He's given us for the sake of the furtherance of the gospel. If we choose not to do this, then we are not making proper use of what God have, has blessed us with. When we talk about leaving a legacy, we must understand that the only legacy that really matters is the legacy of investing in others for the sake of the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's the legacy that needs to be left by our life. This begs us to answer the question, has our use of our possessions brought us closer to God, or have we used our wealth and possessions to gain eternal friends? Or have they only been used to bless ourselves? It's interesting when you go back to the, the, uh, uh, Mr. Criswell's example of the individual that was asked what he had done yesterday. And you look at the answer that was given and he speaks of all the different things that were happening for the sake of the gospel around the world because he had invested in those ministries. 
It's not always just giving money to those ministries. Sometimes it's actually going and, and doing the hands and feet kind of work, especially here locally. But we must ask our question in our own life, have we used the possessions God has given us to advance the gospel? Secondly, this morning, Jesus next taught that we must be faithful and trustworthy with His blessings to us. Notice verse 10 through 12. One who is faithful in very little is also faithful in much. One who is dishonest in very little is also dishonest in much. Sometimes we stop right there, but we really need to read the next two verses to get the full teaching of this. If then you have not been faithful in the unrighteous wealth, who will entrust to you the true riches? And if you have not been faithful in that which is another's, who will give you that which is your own? This is a charge to all that we must be faithful with His, with His blessings, or else He will not trust us with true spiritual riches, such as the care of souls, missions, and evangelism. We may wonder sometimes why churches seem to be dead. There's people that assimilate there, but there's really no activity that goes on. And it could be that they've not been faithful to use the abilities, the talents, the possessions God's given them in order to advance the gospel. And therefore God has said, you can continue to meet, but I can't use you in the, in the world until you start using the possessions I've given you to advance the kingdom. God doesn't call us to just walk through the doors of a church and sit here and not do anything. He calls us to use the gifts, the talents, the abilities we have. And in order to do that, or in order to see God's blessings, we must actually invest those things we've been blessed with. This has somewhat been a plague for Christian leadership for quite a few generations. There was actually a time in the past, and I don't know if it's still this way or not, but shamefully ministers would have a hard time getting a loan because many had not been faithful in paying their bills. That's shameful to the gospel and shameful to the kingdom of God. But I would take it beyond ministers too. When you call yourself a Christian, a believer, Understand that you too have that responsibility to pay the bills that you have. And if you do not, then you not only bring shame to yourself, but you bring shame to the gospel as well. See, it goes beyond just us when we start claiming who we are. This cannot be what happens among God's people. We are nothing more than stewards of our material wealth. God is the owner of it all. And when we fail to pay a bill, we're failing to pay in the name of God. Martin Luther compared our journey through this earth to a guest that travels through a land and comes to a hotel where he is lodging overnight. He takes only food and lodging from the host, and he does not say that the property is his. Our life as a Christian is only lodging for the night as our final destination is not here. But it is in heaven where the Father or the owner of all things resides. Our use of money and our spiritual wealth are bound together and are not separated lives. They are connected. We cannot live compartmentally within our life. Therefore, Jesus teaches thirdly this morning that it is totally impossible to serve both God and money. From verse 13, no servant can serve two masters, for he, either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. This is somewhat of a radical statement, especially if it's the first time hearing it. Because there is no middle ground in this. It's either one or the other. Now we see some very extremes in our world today, especially when it comes to politics. There is, there is either an extreme right or an extreme left, and nothing in the middle seems to be accepted very well. 
Well, I want to tell you, when it comes to spiritual matters, there is either an extreme left or an extreme right, and God doesn't accept anything in the middle. You're either for Him or you're against Him. We cannot be devoted to money and also be devoted to God. I do feel that a few words of clarification should probably be shared before we go on. There are times that we go through where a material focus is somewhat required. And I want you to understand what I mean by that. Such as when we buy a home, then we turn to a, to a material thought because we're providing a home for our family. When we buy a vehicle or when we remodel a home or when we redecorate, the same thing that a church goes through sometimes, churches have to invest in the building that they would meet in at times. That's not wrong unless it goes to an excessive amount and we forget to do ministry work. You see, the possession of wealth does not make a person a materialist. And it does not make someone just devoted to money if they possess wealth. It's about what they do with the wealth. An individual from Uganda, after observing Americans, made the statement that all Americans are wealthy. You see, sometimes we have this thought that there are wealthy people out there that can fund all of these other things. But when looked at from another perspective, an individual from Uganda, when he looked, he said, all Americans are wealthy. Which means that all of us as Christians, as believers, have in some way the ability to, ability to invest in ministry work. No matter how much we have, no matter how little we have, the application of this is relevant to us all. Maybe a good evaluation for us would be if we think about what we most want to talk about with our friends. Think about your conversations over the past week or the past month. Do those conversations, are they gospel related? Are they things that, that would lead to the advancement of the kingdom of God? Or is all of those conversations centered around earthly things? You see, it's a good evaluation for us to just think back on what we've talked about the most. Because that tends to be what we value the most. What are we devoting our minds to on a daily basis? Is the gospel related things really of importance to us? Jesus was extremely forward in His presentation of this to His disciples and those who were gathered. Use what you have available to you to make friends for the kingdom of God. That message is no different then than it is today. Use what you have at your disposal to make friends for the kingdom of God. We are to be wise using all of our intellect and mind and willing to manage our possessions in a way that gains eternal rewards for the glory of the kingdom, not for the glory of ourselves. And as we think on these things this morning, it begs us to ask this question to ourselves: What about us today? Do we have a burden for the lost? And is it enough of a burden that we're willing to use God's blessings in our life to reach those who are lost? Are we willing to have conversations each day that are centered around God instead of, instead of around things of the world all the time? I would ask you this morning as you stand to your feet, as our musicians come, have you put forth much effort to build friends for the kingdom of God? If not, why not make that change today? You see, there's no one that can make it for you. It's something that you must change in where you devote your mind, your life, and your possession. Where your heart is centered. 
Would it be centered from here forward on conversations about God, how good He has been to you, what He can do for others in their life? Or would it be centered on material things about how they can make another dollar or how they can get ahead in life? My hope is that you'll make that decision to be fully devoted with everything in your life to God. And not for your glory, but so that you might make friends for the kingdom of God, so that they might then in turn make friends for the kingdom of God. See, it doesn't end with just your action, and it doesn't end with your friend's action, but it should carry on. Where's your devotion? Who are you serving this morning? Are you serving God? Or are you serving things of the world? Bow with me as we pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you this morning. Lord, thanking you for this time we have to, to allow your word to sink in, to penetrate our heart. Lord, to make us be aware of just where our life is and where our devotion should be. And Lord, this morning, if there is a, a need in someone's life to, to realign their devotion, we pray that they would make that decision this morning. Lord, maybe there's someone here who has just never accepted you, and today is the day that they need to align their life with you, asking for your forgiveness through your Son, Jesus Christ. Lord, if that be the case, we pray that they have the courage to do that this morning. Lord, maybe there's someone here who you've been speaking to for quite some time, just about the way they interact with maybe certain individuals and Lord, maybe you've impressed upon their heart that there needs to be some changes made. We pray that today they would face that reality. And Lord, they would listen to your voice, heed your voice, and be obedient to it. We thank you, Lord, that you are still speaking to the hearts and lives of people today. And Lord, as we allow this time for you to speak to our heart. May we all be obedient in what we do, not only now, but as we go forward from here this week. We pray this in your Son's name, Jesus the Christ. Amen. So our instrumentalists play for just a moment. The song that they're playing is redeemed. When we think about how we are redeemed, by the blood of the Lamb that gave His life upon the cross. We have a tremendous gratefulness that we should have in our life. And it should not lead to us being, I'm going to use the word hoarders of all of His possessions. But it should lead us to a grateful heart that desires for others to know exactly what we've experienced. Would you be faithful in sharing that this week? In your own life, you may be able to say that you're his child and forever you will be. But how many do you interact with that cannot say that? And God has called you to that place, that moment, to be able to share a redeeming grace with them. Would you be faithful to do it? Maybe it's a family member that maybe you've prayed about for a long time but you've never had the courage to actually speak to them about it. And yet God has provided opportunity. Would you take the next opportunity he gives you and use it faithfully to speak to them? You see, all of those questions come down to who are we serving, God or material things. You pray with me again. Dear Heavenly Father, as we close this service this morning, we pray, Lord, that your guidance would be what is first in our life. Lord, that we be faithful to use the opportunities you give us. Lord, that we would be grateful enough for all that you've blessed us with, that we not hoard it, but we share it. 
Lord, we just pray that, that we would be attentive to your Holy Spirit as we go throughout today and throughout this week. We pray this in your Son's name, Jesus the Christ. Amen. We appreciate your attendance today, your attention to God's Word. And uh, we hope that you'll be back this evening at 6 o'clock again. And uh, we invite you to come for that. Be in prayer this afternoon that God's guidance, that we would be attentive to it as we make this decision concerning youth pastors. So we would appreciate your prayers in that area. This time you can be dismissed. We'll dismiss from the back to the front. People in the front, just give them a little bit of time to get out. Y'all turn and wave to about six or seven people. Tell them you miss them and you're glad to see them. <laughs>